measurement. So this is quite different from what Pete's talking about, although you'll see that uh, I'll try and slide some bits and pieces in here. Um, I've actually written up um, quite extensive um, paper on um, uh, power meters, spying them, what you can do with them. As we're talking about things on the second-hand market. Um, I haven't got it into a slide set yet, so um, hence I, I'm not talking with a slide set today. But uh, this is only going to be 10, 10 minutes or so, just showing you the sort of things that you can, uh, that you can get hold of. Probably one of the most basic pieces of um, test kit that uh, I think most people saw would be some sort of power measurement device, or um, not even that really. Uh, we're talking about voltage detection as much as anything. And you probably um, might well see in a flea market um, something that looks a little bit like that or like that, yeah. which is just a detector. It's a diode detector, uh, got a BNC output, and an N-type input, might be SMA if you're really lucky. Um, and all that is is a voltage measuring device that you've then got to put some sort of DC meter onto to give an indication uh, that you've got energy coming out of your system, which is jolly good. Because that's where we, where we start from. Is it all uh, Yeah, these, when you buy them, um, technology is pretty simple. Um, you've got a, in the, in the front here, immediately behind the connector, you've got a, uh, a 50 ohm resistor, it's a rather special one, it's actually a, usually a, uh, a film disc, so it would look uh, a circular disc with a hole in the middle where the pin goes in, so you imagine the energy is distributed all the way around. If you can't just use a couple of uh, resistors at 10G for sure, um, you might get away with it in surface mount, but other than that you have to be fairly special about. At least have a radial disc, then um, that also provides the, uh, the ground um, return for the diode, because the diode's in series. Some of them have a DC block, they have a series capacitor, and some of them don't. So be very careful about it, because if they don't, and you've got the DC on the thing, it will blow them up. On the back end, there's usually another shunt capacitor behind the diode, um, and <coughs> that's it. And there may sometimes be an integrated resistor. The problem you have is you have to put one in. You have to put a load on the back end. And there are all sorts of recommendations about what that load might be. And it actually depends what you want to do with it. So you might have a high impedance thing like a 10K or more. Um, scalar network analyzers tend to use fairly high impedances, for example. Um, for power measurement, you're probably better off putting something a bit smaller. I've used a K open quite often. Um, tend to get slightly better linearity, do not it? Depends whether you're trying to measure small or large signals. Um, so that's where you might start. That's what you might, you know, pick off with. You, you perhaps have some, buy something like that at the flea market. And the slight snag, of course, again, is that um, at a flea market, there is a possibility that the uh, things are blown up. Uh, I've got an old Marconi one here. And this one's kind of nice because if you blow up the diode, you can actually pull it out. <laughs> it's a cartridge diode, so you can take it out and put another one in. Um, most of the other types are not like that. I do know people have replaced the diode in the HP one, but it's a heck of a job. Okay, so moving on, what happens when you come to buy your first power meter? Now, number one problem that arises usually is that at a flea market, there's a trader selling some nice shiny power meters. This would be a typical example. It's really good. A nice meter, I like these. It's an HP 435. It's been around for a lot of years. They were designed in the uh, 1970s, early early 70s actually. Um, 
prior to that, the two most common, I've got both, but I couldn't bring all my power meters, I've got quite a big collection. <laughs> I've worked in the test equipment industry for 39 years. So. Um, the Marconi 6460, which is a big square, grey square box, is quite a common one. Uh, and the um, HP 432, which is in the same shape of package as that, but has a rather bigger uh, connector on it for the uh, sensor. A lot of these pop up at um, flea markets for anywhere between 15 and 50 pounds, and perhaps a bit more if they're newer. The only slight snag is that uh, if they're 15 pounds, they sound like a bargain, but unfortunately, unless you can get the sensors for them, you're really wasting your time because you can do nothing with them. The bit that you need is this bit. In fact, even more so, and I'll warn you about this because I think, because it actually happened with this particular one I got this way, <clears throat> if you get the sensor on its own, you've still got this problem of getting hold of the lead for it. And I'll tell you what, the leads are harder to get than the sensors. So, um, I happen to uh, have a couple of spare leads that in the drawer at work some, some years ago, so I acquired them as they weren't being used. But um, the other types you might come across are um, there's quite a lot of power meters out on the market at the moment. The biggest um, uh, customer for them, if you like, is the, uh, the MOD. They buy them and stick them in the stores in Harrogate for 10 years and then sell them off. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and um, uh, there have been quite a few on the market. Um, fairly recently, the digital version that came just after this, which is the uh, HP 436, it got, it's got a red LED display, you might find them. They're quite attractive, a bit bigger, about that much wider, same height. Um, and you'll see quite a lot of those around. I've not seen any sensors for them, so that, that's a big problem. The other ones that are quite common is the um, Marconi 6960. This is a, an old one because this one came out, came out of uh, stores that have been laying there for 20 years and uh, they don't want it in there anymore. Will I take it off site? It's for pleasure. <laughs> um, and this is a digital readout power meter. And um, the MOD bought a lot of these, but with the grey, very light grey front panel with a blue stripe across, uh, looks something like that across the top. And I know the MOD had um, about 2,000 of them. And a big chunk of them came up um, last year, or just the end of the year before, I can't quite remember. And uh, mostly they came up on their own with no sensors, and that's what tends to happen. There's two reasons for that. One's fairly obvious. The MOD don't sell off as many sensors as they do meters because they blow them up, <laughs> so they keep some spare. Um, and the ones they do release, very often you'll find a dealer might have bought them in advance and disappear out of the market. And a friend of mine managed to get one. He got a Mark 8660B for £75, and he got a sensor for £75, so it's quite a big outlay, £150 for that lot, and he blew the sensor up. <laughs> and the only spare sensor you can get now, I, 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 can't, I don't know if he's paid the money, but he was quoted £150 for just the sensor. That gives you an idea of the problem that you get. Quite a lot of the earlier ones change hands for much, much less than that. You can get a metre and a sensor for £50 quite easily. And that's where most people start off, I would suggest. Um, a word then about the technology, because there are different types of sensors. Fundamentally, with these, all of those power meters, there are two types of sensor available in technology terms. One is a diode sensor, so it's the little detectors we're looking at. The other type are, are thermal sensors. Okay? They're based on some type of thermal measuring device. And those split into two subsets. There is a third. I'll mention it briefly as a thing called an ometer. 
and you won't find one of those for any of these type of meters. So, um, the other two are either thermistor sensors, and you'll get that on an HP432 or a Marconi 6460, it would look like that. Yeah. Thermistors. The problem with thermistor sensors is that the maximum power handling is about 10 milliwatts. They're very easy to blow up, and they're very difficult to repair, although I do know people who have done it. Um, so, watch that. The thing you have to do if you've got something that's vulnerable is to, you have to have a good collection of these things, attenuators. In. And always keep one on it, I think is the advice. It's just so easy to blow it up. A friend of mine who blew his, 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 his sensor up, got a lot or two of 23 cents too near it. You know, forgot to put the attenuator in. I think it was too. It's the old problem. He was tuning it up, didn't have enough power, so he took the attenuator out, tweaked the wrong trimmer, and the thing suddenly went full scale on him. Um, That's not, a, not bad advice for a spec analyzer as well. No, always, always put the attenuator on the front end. Spec analyzer, yeah, yeah I like yeah. that with mine as well. So, so, um, so yeah, it you know, really is quite a problem. So that's the Mr. Sensors, 10 milliwatts max. So you, you need to know which sort you've got. The other type, and I've got two of them here. These are two thermal sensors. These use exactly the same technology. This is the HP one. This is the Marconi one. Um, they use semiconductor thermocouples. Actually, technically called a CBEC sensor. Um, obviously, I invented them. But they are semiconductor thermocouples. These are a little more robust. They'll take 100 milliwatts, right? So you've got 10 times as much power handling. Still blow them up. That's what this friend of mine did. <laughs> um, usually, and I'm pretty sure I'm right about this, they'll handle yeah, plus 26 dBm average. So although the meter, meter in part of it, in each case, will prevent you reading above 100 milliwatts with them, or plus 20 dBm, 100 milliwatts, um, they'll actually handle 400 milliwatts into the sensor without blowing up continuous. They're not very good if you put a watt peak into them. You might you might get away with it. You might get away with a watt for not too long. Any more than that, you blow them. So as I say, these are a bit more robust, but they do blow up. So again, ten rows up. The other type of sensor that you can get with these same meters are these. These are diode power sensors. And the difference is that these are much more sensitive, basically. Um, quick recap back here. I'm talking about maximum power of these things, plus 20 dBm or 100 milliwatts. The minimum power of them is is not that low. They'll go down to um, typically minus 30 dBm. We'll do a conversion of some of these nanowatts. Um, and for some things that's not quite low enough. You have a bit more sensitivity. So for that reason they produce diode power sensors. And these go down to minus 70 dBm, so they're well down. Um, well, semiconductor thermocouples, 50 dB of range. I think to remember the um, thermistor ones are about 45 dB of range, so a little bit less range. The diode ones, in theory, could have much more, 70 dB. They're pretty much always limited to 50 by the manufacturers. There's good reason for that, which actually moves into using the television and other things. If you use a diode sensor, um, they limit them to 50 dB of range to keep them in the square wall region. Because although the sensor itself will work above that, what happens is, if you look at its characteristic, it sort of go up like that, and then suddenly bend over, and where it bends over is famously called the knee. And uh, you have to start doing a lot of compensating at that point. And that 
point where it turns over is also unstable in temperature. And you change the temperature, it changes where that point is. So, be a bit careful of diode sensors. Uh, Brian, uh, yes. with a diode sensor, um, what's the uh, maximum power you can put onto it? Right, good question. And that's, the good news is that with a diode sensor, which is nice and sensitive, goes down to minus 70 dBm, you can actually put plus 26 dBm into it. So you can actually drive a lot of power into it, it won't blow it up. It's actually more robust than, the, um, than these thermal sensors. But the meter will overrange long before you get there. So you can actually drive them harder. We don't blow up so we if you put a watt into it, maybe they'll probably blow up. If, if you stuck a, a 30 EV attenuator in front of it, mm -hmm. uh, that would be about the same as the other sensor. It would. Yeah. Well, you've got an accurate, of, and you have a lot of protection, but yeah. the accuracy might fail a bit with the. Uh, yeah, that's, that's the big problem. Because um, that's the next part of it, really, is what happens when you start measuring signals. Um, these things are designed by the manufacturers to measure CW signals, you know, continuous sinusoidal signals. That's, that's what they're designed to measure. And they do that with a certain rated accuracy, which goes back to the NPL. Um, I don't know if you know, the RF power is the least accurate measurement, I think, <laughs> that we actually have. We go to the National Physical Laboratory in Teddington in London. And they'll start talking about um, two and three percent if you're lucky <laughs> on a good day. Um, so it's not like measuring frequency. We can do that to one part and tend to be quite a lot. Measuring power is pretty tricky. So <coughs> we can do that. But at hand at that, that is with um, a sinusoidal CW signal, just a sine wave. What happens when you put modulation on it? Well, and this is the big problem now. These two sensors, when you put modulation on them, react completely differently. Now, if we put FM on them, they'll read the same. Within whatever limit, more or less. As soon as we put an AM waveform in, like a TV waveform, which is big peak to average ratio, you'll suddenly get some mysterious numbers appearing. <laughs> they, don't, they won't react in the same way. Um, the one I like the most is the multi-signal environment. If you put two signals into one of these, into a thermal sensor, the thermal sensor will sum the two signals accurately and tell you what the sum of the powers is. If I put two signals in at 10 milliwatts, it can tell you it's 20, 20 milliwatts, which is pretty good. If you do that in the diode sensor, the number you get would be quite a lottery. You could easily read four times the number or half the number. And I once remember, Peter, I think, I think it appeared in microwave news, somebody saying they've got a pair of solfan units or something like that, and they, they combined them in some way, put it on their power meter, and measured four times the power, which I thought was interesting when I read it. <laughs> Conservation of energy doesn't work here. <laughs> There's no way you could get four times by putting two oscillators in. And I suspect what was happening is the two signals, depending on whether they're in or out of phase, you either get a peak voltage summed in a diode sensor that gives you four times the, the voltage. And of course, because the thing's just doing V squared over R, <laughs> it measures four times, or it says it's four times the power. Mm -hmm. If you do it in a thermal sensor, you never do that. Give you that for one bucket. So um, that turns out to be quite interesting. The problem you have when you measure a TV waveform is what, what, do you, what do you expect to get when you measure it, with a, let's say, with a thermal sensor? They're designed to measure average power. So, because it peak whites the most, isn't it? So if you were black, you probably wouldn't be measuring very much. And it'll average it over time. And then that depends on the meter, how you set that, that up, because on a digital meter like this one, you can set the average factor. So depending on where you set it and what type of answer you might get. 
Um, the analog one's a bit simpler because it will just read some number. So it's something you've got to watch when you use power meters. What you see is not what you get. So is the advice then to use, use, sort of take the modulation away and see what you get? Yeah. And then make some assumptions that that's the maximum power you can get. And if you look at the um, cellular radio industry, you know, mobile phone industry, what they do is <coughs> have a lot of point to point links. You'll probably be aware of that within the towers. Uh, there's lots of um, point to point stuff around. Uh, I think that's right. And if you look at all the specs for those, um, they're all based on CW power. Yeah. So they take the mod off and then just measure the, the, the carrier power. And it's actually how, the license, how their licenses are written by other people. So that's what they have to do. And then they apply the mod. So that's, that's the normal way to do it. Mostly for us, um, measuring something like 10 gig power, which you can do with, it, with any of these quite easily. These are all the um, 18 gig sensors I've got here. Um, it's not much of a problem. If you try and put an SSB signal in, you might get some funny numbers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So again, it's probably best to switch the rig to CW, pull the key down, measure that. That's what, that's what you do. Um, so other odd meters I've got here, which might start appearing on the surplus market, is a, a handheld meter, and they work with the same sensors as that one. Um, a lot of the installers, mobile phone installers, bought these. We've got two types. This one's got a power reference on it, this one hasn't. Um, these two, you see the N type connector. That's a 50 meg, 1 milliwatt output um, reference. So it allows you to calibrate the sensor. And of course, when, when they get sent in for calibration, calibration house measures how close to a milliwatt that is. And this one's got the same thing built in, and this one hasn't. And this one you can calibrate it, but you have to have some, another 50 meg reference, as you can see. I would say, well, some haven't got a problem, but <laughs> if you don't have one, it's, these are cheaper, so that's part of the reason for it. Um, that becomes a problem when you've got all these diode sensors because they're not designed to measure zero dBm, it's off, off the scale. So the manufacturers do supply 30 dB attenuator to go with them. Um, if you ever pick up one of these with a power meter, be a bit careful. Um, this one happens to be an 18 gig attenuator, but usually they're not. They're usually one gig attenuators, and people have said, why are you supplying a 1 gig attenuator with an 18 gig or whatever power meter? And the answer is that the reference is 50 megs. <laughs> and we used to order them as being you know, as near to 30 dB as possible at 50 megahertz. If you didn't care what it did out, that was what happened. There's not a clue with the calibration. Does it curve on that? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, not on the internet, <coughs> but um, we might get it on one. The, the HP one uh, is very precise, isn't it? It's, yeah. um, uh, uh, yeah, that's right. Well, that's, that's what they do. You see, the manufacturers are used to that. Uh, Mark only we used to buy them with a specific figure at, um, at 50 meg. Yeah, I, I've tried using the normal 30 meg uh, attenuator. Yeah, it's good. This one's a bit of a hybrid. I've got a Weinshaw one here that actually was um, was one that we tried out, and they actually made it 30 dB. So. Um, at 50 megs, <laughs> but it's actually an 18 gig attenuator that I've designed to be a dual roll one. But they usually got a calibration thing on the side of them, don't they? So, uh, yeah, some of them have and some of them haven't. The Wancho ones actually don't have it. Yeah. But, uh, some of the good ones have got them. The Mark Haley yeah. ones do. The yeah. odd thing is they're both made by Wancho. <laughs> so I've got a 436, <laughs> yeah. but uh, I managed to get ahead, believe it or not, with cable for 12 quid. <laughs> I'm not going to tell you. Yeah. And I said to this guy, it does work. He, he, he lives very near to where you two live. Um, and I said, um, I, said, I said, do you know what you're selling? He says, yeah, I was in the business. Yeah, two or three of them. Uh, anyway, the thing is, it, uh, uh, the three, 436 didn't come with the HP attenuator. So I'll have to use other attenuators. Yeah. 
but I get the impression it's pretty well spot on compared with my other power meters. But uh, you get a good uh, Narda attenuator or something that's calibrated. But, uh, of course, HP will say you have to use their attenuator. <laughs> And if you want that, you're going to pay through the nose for a proper one. Part of the reason why they're not signal actually, I'm going to sort of explain it, is mm. that the manufacturers of the attenuators, so you sell like this one, an 18 gig attenuator, they sell the same as the Nord one, they sell the same as the Nord one, they sell the same as the Nord one, and you look at the curves on them, the fan, mm. all they tend to do is they have a sort of a curve, you imagine something like that, and it's, they put the, well, the line down the middle of it, so it's a bit under at the bottom edges, the, the two top and bottom, and uh, it through in the middle. They do that deliberately <laughs> because they're trying to get something that's sort of roughly um, 30 gb or whatever the value is um, over a wide range. You can't make it flat. So uh, that's, that's, that's usually what they do. How will I measure that with one? Be careful. Be careful. It depends what width is. Two megahertz, actually. Uh, isn't it a spectrum? Oh, well, yes, but I mean, I'm, well, I'm just saying how do I, if I was going to measure that, that box. That, that's actually a big that, that box produces there. Yeah, is that a single pulse? No, it's a QPSK. So, so it's a repeating pulse. It's, it's a period. It's if you know period. what the period yeah. is, well, a lot of these power well, meters do, do, this one probably won't, but that certainly will, um, you can put into it... Um, on the right button. There's a duty cycle button on it. Yeah. It's done for measuring pulse mod, mm. pulse modulation. And would that measure sort of the average power or the peak? Measure the average power, not the peak. Mm. Always, these yeah. meters are, all, are always set up to measure average power, mm. even when they're using diode sensors. No way to make so the diode peak. sensors are peak for So you're applying a sort of a mathematical yeah. scaling yeah. factor, are you? Uh, effectively, you're scaling. Imagine a 10 to 1 waveform. You've got repeating pulse every, you know, 10, 10 to 1 ratio. You could put a factor of 10 in, and what it effectively does measures the average power and multiplies by 10. Yeah. So you know, it's a pretty simple way of doing it. But, but you can only do it for repetitive waveforms. You can't do it when the waveforms all over the place. So you imagine something like um, 64 quam, for example. Very repetitive when it's being driven. <laughs> so, uh, you know, anything that's time driven is a bit of a problem. Uh, unless you're running, I mean, the, the trick is to actually put um, lots of ones in, you know, repeating lots of ones, and then, you, then you've got an average waveform. And anything other than that, you can't do that. And if you've got repetitive waveform, something like that, because that's pretty much a pulse mod type thing, then you can do it. But that, what if from, is that on the school, bro? That's not the special one, it's the yeah. So, the so that's actually, the power is constant yeah. during the top. Yeah. 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 You can just measure the power straight off the uh, analyzer. Exactly, yeah. 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 If you trust the analyzer. Well, yeah. But well, there's going to be an error on the analyzer, there's always is. Or a lead to it. Well, it's smooth. Yeah. No, I mean, you've well, got one way of doing yeah. it, David. Yeah. Yeah. You've got a sig gen that's producing a CW signal. Crank it up to the same True. level, True. Mm. measure it with power meters. Mm. Mm. Yeah, that's mm. what I do. Yes, yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. 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 And check a white form. In fact, the, the, exactly that, yeah. so. the, the encoder, which I'll talk about after the break, has actually got a mode where it switches the mod off and gives you a single carrier right. so that you can make the power measurement. Uh, uh, oh, that's then a quite, that's the that's the mod off. Uh, that's so, a modulation thing. That's, that's a regular satellite signal, to, but it's a narrow band one. So it's giving all these uh, different yeah, carrier fares and three and number of not, not Q, It's not CFPM, it's, it, it's, it's just uh, QPSK. So it's constant amplitude and the phases. But the trouble ah, with that, right. that, that, that particular waveform is smooth, so you can't see most of the mods being removed by the smoothing to, show, to make ah, it a sensible looking picture. I see what you're getting at now, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I, that would be fuzzy. If I switch the smoothing off, the fuzziness is about that big. Right, I'm with you. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That, totally, I mean, it only makes the point that Brian's so saying I'm just the difficulty of measuring these things in life, you yeah. know? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Yeah, if you'd put this fuzziness on, I'd be. Yeah. Yes, you would have recognised it. Yeah. 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 Okay, we're coming up about for, ready for a break. Right. Okay, uh, th thanks very much, Brian. That was uh, <coughs> an interesting topic. I mean, uh, I have to say, when it, I've done power measurements on some of these digital systems, it is quite a different thing. You really have to think what you're doing. You know, 
for a nice FM or a single CW carrier. Um, what's coming up? What's well, probably happened actually is um, the the mobile telephone industry, you know, drives a lot of a lot of things because it's so big, and um, there's a need to measure a lot of these funny waveforms actually uh, over bigger dynamic ranges than the diode sensors or the thermal sensors could manage, and so. The manufacturers are very keen to have power meters that went beyond that. And clearly the technology that was available or was being used wasn't going to do the job in quite the right way. And though what they, so effectively what they've done is adapted it. So what you're finding now is, is smart power meters. Uh, if you look in the test lab, there's a very nice um, HP meter. This is the net, that's the generation back. But the latest versions of it, and uh, and Ritzy do the same thing, um, uh, have a have a um, a lot more processing power inside with a DSP in there, and they can they can analyse different waveforms. And the problem then came: what do you do with the sensor? Because you've got these big peak to average waveforms going on. So what they've done is they've adapted the diode power sensor, and they've adapted it as a couple of different um, techniques, but they're well, the same technique, but different uh, ways to implement it. Uh, what they've done is basically taken the diodes um, sensor, integrated it with a, a little power splitter and the attenuator, and put another diode sensor. And then, so you've actually got two diodes now with, operating at different levels. So what they then do is the meter switches between them, and they integrate the two together. So you get twice, effectively double the dynamic range. One of the manufacturers has three, with three steps in it, three diodes. You flip around the diodes. So the, they start off by looking at one furthest back at the lowest level. And if that's not enough, they move forward one and so on. And the DSP sorts it all out and sorts out the waveform as well. So they can actually use it. Effectively, it's like a sampling scope. Is there a tremendous dynamic range in mobile phone signal? Yeah, yeah. I would say. In some of them, yeah. You know, any, anything with time varying, because imagine you've got um, eight time slots and there's only, only one occupied, you haven't got very much, very much energy. Mm -hmm. You mentioned this, this particular waveform and the difficulty of looking at it, reviewing, deciding what you've got. I mean, I noticed that there's more and more, there's quite a lot of these handheld spectrum analyzers. I mean, uh, and many of the more expensive spectrum analyzers actually allowed you to <coughs> make a, um, a power measurement of the unit. I mean, is there any, any trend to sort of giving you a picture? And well, that's, in fact, the, the modern power meters do do that. Right. They, actually, they actually have um, effectively a little LCD on them. Instead of a, you know, a simple LCD like that with just numbers, they actually are like a, like a, like a screen. On there, but know. do you still have to make... So it's a PDA. In fact, you can get a um, spectrum analyzer in the PDA now. So. Yes. Um, but it's the same thing, it's a PDA type display, and you'll actually see the waveform. But do you have to sort of make some decision about what you're looking at? Uh, you may do, yes. You right. may have to tell it. To say it is a COFDM signal or a crown or whatever. Mm, very interesting. Right.